Thank you, Sue, and welcome to everyone from around the world. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you're joining us. As Sue indicated, my name is Jeffrey Hull. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Coaching, and I am thrilled to be kicking off our fall season of webinars um, with Dr. Jeffrey Pfeffer from Stanford University, who has an amazing new book out called Seven Rules of Power. Surprising, but true advice on how to get things done and advance your career. So I am sure that many of you are familiar with Jeff's work. And um, I was looking over some of the mo many, many books he's written, the bestsellers that he's written. And I remember my own introduction to his work um, came when he was writing uh, leadership. I'm trying to remember it. Leadership BS <laughs> was one of my favorites. Um, I don't remember how many years ago that, that you wrote that, Jeff, but it really got me definitely thinking. It was provocative. Um, as someone who was originally in HR, became a psychologist, and then worked in leadership development, I was uh, animated, to say the least, by your thought-provoking um, research and writing in that book and in many other books. So. Jeff has asked me today to conduct our webinar as a fireside chat format. So rather than doing a formal presentation, I'm gonna to get to play Oprah and uh, interview Jeff, which is really an honor because I've been reading his books for many, many years. And I think many of us are familiar with his work. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to be in discussion dialogue with him. And to that uh, end, we're also gonna be looking to have a lot of dialogue with you so we will encourage you, I want to repeat what Sue said earlier, which was we will encourage you to try to use the Q&A box so that we can try a number of folks. We're going to have probably up to upwards to a thousand of you. So between Jeff and me, we're going to do our best to read the chat, read the Q&A. And before we kick off, though, for anyone who is not familiar with Jeff Pfeffer's work, let me just give you a little bit of background. He is the Thomas D. D., the second professor of organizational behavior at Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's the author or co-author of 16 books on topics, evidence-based management, and what he calls the knowing-doing gap, which I'm sure he'll refer to today when we talk. He received his PhD from Stanford and taught at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the University of California, Berkeley, but ultimately returned to Stanford in 1979 as a full professor. He is the author of many, many articles and books chapters and has won numerous awards for his scholarly research, including an honorary doctorate from Tilburg University in the Netherlands, which is right down the street from where I am right now. So that's quite an honor. He has taught seminars in 40 countries and been a visiting professor at Harvard Business School, London Business School, Singapore Management University, and for many years, IESE in Barcelona serves on the board of directors of several human capital software companies and other public and private company nonprofit boards. And he lives in California, which he's joining us today from Northern California. And for those of you that are not familiar, you may wanna look into his website and get, not only grab this wonderful new book, but um, I've also read Dying for a Paycheck um, his original book called Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't. And I think this current book kind of updates that. But they're all really excellent reads, especially for us coaches who are looking to support our clients to be effective in their leadership roles and to really work towards success, both in profession and in life. So with that, I want to welcome Jeff. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me as part of the uh, as, as part of this event. It's a pleasure to have you, and uh, I want to just take a minute to say hello to folks that are saying hi from all over the world. So you get a chance to see. We have people calling in. I mean, uh, joining us from. Oh my God! I can't even begin. Everywhere from Boston to Sacramento to South Africa to Atlanta, from Canada, Winnipeg, Canada, Germany, Chicago, the Bahamas. Ooh, that's nice. Philadelphia, I can't. Uh, Brussels. So people from all over the world. And um, 
I think, needless to say, uh, this is such an honor for me to get an opportunity. I've read a number of your books. I'm excited to be with you today. I'd love to start, Jeff, with um, asking you to recount maybe the story. And I know it's early in the book you mentioned, you, you described this, but what led you to want to write about power one more time? <clears throat> well, um, several things. Number one is I've, uh, you know, taught both an online and then, of course, the on-campus version of this class for many years. Um, I've slowly evolved in my ability to convey the material and to, uh, and to understand where people are challenged by this material, as they often are. And so I thought I would try to take that learning and uh, try to present the material in a more effective way. I think that's number one. Number two, I hear all the time um, statements that I don't actually believe have any empirical um, evidence behind them, but I hear them all the time, that power is different, that we live in a world of social media, which we obviously do, uh, that we have a new generation, et cetera, et cetera, and so that the rules of power have changed. Um, there have been books called New Power, uh, co-written by my dear friend Henry Timms. There's uh, Moses Nayem's book, The End of Power. Uh, the power has changed. Uh, there's no evidence for that. Um, but uh, so I wanted to take that challenge head on as well. And so that's really why I wrote a, another book on, uh, on power, uh, to really try to um, um, explain things, I think, more effectively and to deal in the introduction with this idea that things are different, uh, which they aren't. Uh, the other thing I've done in this book, which, which began really in power, but this book opens, um, you know, I hear also the other story, which I think is also incorrect, is that, you know, the, my perspective on power is only good if you're a, um, a white man. Um, and so the book begins with an example of an African-American woman, ends with an example of an African-American woman, has, you know, a Nigerian woman who works for, or worked, and she doesn't anymore, for the largest Italian oil company, et cetera, et cetera. So this book is filled with examples, in addition to, of course, being filled with the latest social science research, it's filled with examples of diverse people from literally around the world to try to get away from this idea um, that, uh, that these principles and these ideas apply only to, um, you know, uh, dominant, uh, you know, white males. Yeah, I can totally appreciate that. I think that obviously diversity is a crucial, diversity, inclusion, equity, social justice are crucial right. topics in the last couple of years, last few years. They have been for decades, but really coming to a pivotal moment. And the fact that you're very clear throughout the book with your case studies that these principles are applicable to everyone yeah. and in fact can really support the elevation and the movement towards success and power and leadership yeah of minorities, of women, of people of color is, is a really powerful testament. I'm curious to hear you say a little bit more about what your thoughts on are on why supposedly in the last few years, the literature on power or in leadership development has changed. What, what brought that about, do you think? Um, I think people are looking for um, positive messages. I think people are looking for a subject that you and I talked about when we talked the other day. They're looking for, in quotes, principal leadership or ethical leadership or all kinds of words in, in, in advance of the word leadership. And I would just remind, you know, I, I would say two things. Number one, I use executive coaches in both my on-campus and online versions of this class. The on-campus version, I have six coaches, three for each section. And for the online version, which has an enrollment of 400, I use or 17 or 18 uh, coaches, or we call them course facilitators, but they are essentially executive coaches. So this is a class, and my course has been built around uh, the idea that we will um, use executive coaches to help people with their doing power project, number one, and number two, to get over any self uh, doubts or self inhibitions that get in their way of, um, of being as powerful as they can be. Um, and so I am quite comfortable with the idea of coaching around power because because I use coaches in the class, both the online and the on-campus version. And, uh, and um, one of my coaches who I had dinner with when I was in Spain recently pointed out to me that now 70% of his clients um, are women 
uh, or people from underrepresented groups in the U.S., maybe African Americans or Latinos. In other countries, uh, different groups that would also be considered uh, disadvantaged or in some way in the minority. So, so, so the um, the clientele of my coaches has really, I think, um, reflected the fact that this is a book that tries to um, empower people uh, to um, to be more successful in their careers. Right. Yeah, no, I can appreciate that. And having read the book, I can, I can say that I appreciated that the, at the very end towards or towards the very end of the book, you actually point to the value of coaching. Um, when you had a case study of a woman who was uh, put in a very difficult position and given, um, but, but the, you're, you're also quite pointed in the way you uh, described the coaching dynamic in that you said the coach offered a lot of empathy and uh, um, compassion. And you said you probably should have fired that coach. <laughs> yeah. well, I, so, I, 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 th I think people need to, I think you, you all, obviously we need to be empathetic, but we also right. need to te teach people how to deal with these situations and, and let them understand, you know, I mean, one of the principles that I try to teach in my class, and I think one of the principles that underlies this book is the idea that we are responsible as HR people have told us for 50 years, we are responsible for our careers. And the only person whose behavior we can actually really control is our own. And so therefore we really have a responsibility and a, um, and a, and a task to be as effective as possible in dealing with difficult situations. And maybe people are gonna not be nice or fair, or maybe they will be prejudiced, maybe there will be many things, maybe they will uh, do all kinds of things to try to outmaneuver us, but uh, you know, and, and, and none of this is of course very nice, but the only person who we can, the only, the only way to really deal with that is to be in control of our own behavior and to be as effective as we can be. Yeah, and I think that that's what you were pointing to in that little vignette about the coach, that the, a really powerful coach would have been both empathetic and compassionate, but also having a dialogue with that individual about what they could potentially do, what their practices could be to take that situation and turn it around and to exert their power and influence, right? Yep, yep. that's right. So I would love to jump in already to our questions because Suzanne cook Groiter, who I know well and is a um, very well-known coach and a thought leader for the Institute of Coaching, has the, co the question that I had on the tip of my tongue. So thank you, Suzanne, which is to start right off with why seven? Um, we're going to ask you to walk us through what the seven principles are, but she's asking why not eight? Why not 10? Why not six? It seems to her a bit limiting and a bit over certain. So I'm curious what your response is to that. Well, you know, in 1956, a guy published an article called uh, The Magic Number Seven, Plus or Minus Two. You can right. keep about seven things in your head. Um, more than that is too many. Fewer than that is probably too few. Um, there are uh, there are many, as I point out in the book, many examples of seven. There are the seven wonders of the world, uh, you know, the seven seas, the seven this, the seven that. Um, I think seven habits. Um, so, um, so seven seemed like a good number. Um, and of course, you can expand or contract depending upon how you want. But seven seemed like a good number to capture uh, what needed to be captured and, and to be things that people can remember in their head. Right. Yeah, we'll seven, deal that. The seven things which you kind of led me into. So I will, I will go over them very quickly and then we can talk about them if you want in more detail. The first, uh, the, the first rule of power is the, the first rule, which I think is the most important, or maybe the second most important, is to get out of your own way, uh, to, to not engage in what I would call preemptory apology, to not in any way describe yourself in ways that disempower you, uh, to not say, I'm not, you know, I can't do this or I can't do that, I'm an introvert or I'm a, you know, whatever. Um, a, a power is basically a skill that people right. can learn. We're not asking people to change um, their race, their gender, their personality, or anything else. These are skills. And just as you can learn tennis or to play the piano or to speak a different language, you can learn the skills of power. Uh, so the first rule is to get out of your own way. The second rule, of course, is to break the rules um, uh, because um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote this famous 
article in the New Yorker many years ago, how David beats Goliath. And of course, how David beats Goliath is David is not going to fight Goliath using Goliath's um, rules because otherwise he wouldn't be able to probably move in the armor and the sword with the sword. And so David is going to fight the battle as he would as a shepherd. And the general principle, I think, is that you want to break the rules because um, uh, oftentimes the rules disadvantage you if you're not already in a, a powerful position. Yeah, you talk in the book a lot about the, uh, I think you called it appropriate inappropriateness or something like that. <laughs> I, I, think that I think that's right. Um, yeah. I think then the other thing, uh, rule three, is to act and speak with power. Um, as we know from studies of communication, um, uh, the, the most important aspect is um, how you look, your body language. Uh, second is how you sound. By far the least important in terms of persuading other people is the content of what you say, believe it or not. And so, and, you know, again, my colleague Dana Carney at Berkeley has, uh, and Amy Cuddy, of course, has done this fabulous TED Talk on presence and body language, and Dana's writing a book on body language. These are also things that can be mastered. Rule four is to build a powerful brand, uh, because I think it, just as uh, we, are, we are all in the business of selling ourselves and selling our ideas all the time, and brand and, 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 pr and pr building a brand and promoting that brand is important for people, certainly in their careers. Rule five is to network relentlessly. Most people spend insufficient time building social relationships. If leadership or management is getting things done through other people, the more other people you know, and the more others, uh, the more supporters you have, the better off you're going to be. That seems pretty right. obvious to me. Uh, rule six is to use your power. Uh, the, the more uh, power is not something that's some kind of scarce resource that the more you use it, the less you have. To the extent that you actually use your power and get things done, more people will want to be associated with you. Uh, you know, to the extent that you're able to start things, initiatives inside of companies or startups, if you're talking about being an entrepreneur, to the extent that you're able to be successful, you're going to get more backers, you're going to get more talent wanting to work with you, and, uh, and the processes will become like sometimes it's called a flywheel effect. And rule seven, because many people say, you know, what will happen once you have power? Won't people envy you? Won't people try to bring you down? Won't there be some kind of homeostatic process? And the answer to that is no. Um, as we know, and I tried to illustrate in Rule, se uh, in rule 7, uh, once you have power and success, what you did to get it will be, for the most part, uh, forgotten, forgiven, or both. So those are the seven rules of power. Yes, excellent. And uh, I... I want to actually jump into all of them, but let's quickly look at one thing that jumped out at me. Um, I'm not sure which rule this is under, but you have quite a lot in the book about um, your challenge to those of us who like to think of ourselves as working towards authenticity, authentic leadership. I thought that was really interesting and provocative that you're basically saying that this whole idea of there being an authentic self is sort of uh, unprovable. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, first of all, in the leadership quarterly, there's a thing that uh, basically eviscerates authentic leadership. But I would uh, point people to Adam Grant's column in the New York Times some years ago, which is entitled something like, unless you're Oprah, uh, be yourself is terrible advice. Uh, you do not actually, I, I think as a leader, you do not need to be authentic to who you are. You need to be authentic to what the human beings around you need from you. So to take right. a simple example, if you don't feel well, if you've had a setback, if you've had, um, you know, if uh, your significant other has left you or your children have acted up or, you know, you've got all kinds of trouble, um, I don't think you necessarily need to bring that to work. Uh, you know, people around you want your energy, they want your confidence, uh, they, want your, they want you to be attentive to their needs, not necessarily to your own needs. So to me, the idea of authenticity is too, both self-referential and, and too egocentric. Um, you know, le leaders, leaders need to be true to what the human beings around them need from them. Yeah, I thought that you did a really nice job in the book of describing the paradoxes of vulnerability. You know, a lot of uh, leadership work these days talks about the value of being willing, especially like during the pandemic, of having empathy as a leader and being more being more vulnerable. 
But you gave quite a few good examples of where showing your vulnerability actually backfires. You could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, no, I think, you know, there's some social science research that suggests that, um, that, that I, th I think people confuse, God, people confuse everything. But one, <laughs> of the things I think, uh, one of the things I think people confuse is what you want to do in interpersonal relationships, maybe with your friends, your children, your significant other, and what you want to do at work. I mean, work is, work is different. You know, and I don't think you right. want to, you know, and you don't show up, most of us don't show up to work in our pajamas. Most of us uh, don't, you know. Well, these days, I don't know about that. But. <laughs> the work, I think the work context is different and that's what this research shows. The research that I'm citing and that I cite in the book is a study which demonstrates that yes, you want to be, you know, I mean, vulnerability builds a, an interpersonal closeness, but in tasks, and, you know, particularly if you're in a powerful position, people don't want to necessarily see that vulnerability. They want to see that you know what you're doing, that they right. that you have that you have confidence. You know, Cameron Anderson has a lot of research on how confidence often gets associated with competence. And so they want they want you to show up in a way that says, you know, I, I, I can follow Jeffrey Hull, not because he's, you know, sweet. Uh, but because he actually knows what the hell he's doing and he's going to lead us to success against opposition and oftentimes against conflict as well. So, and it doesn't, I, I, yeah. it, it doesn't have to be an either or, right? No, I mean, correct. there, are, yeah, there are appropriate, but we may have swung because of the pandemic or, or current trends or whatever, we may have swung a bit too far in the other direction that uh, yeah. vulnerability is key. I, there was an article, let me say one other thing, then I'll let you talk again. Uh, there was an article I posted in LinkedIn uh, on, on this vulnerability thing um, uh, from the New York Times, which talks about, you know, the bosses is crying even as they're laying people off, which is kind of an interesting, you know, <laughs> an interesting mix of, uh, you know, ostensible vulnerability or kind of virtue signaling, even as uh, people are not treating their employees particularly well. Well, that would be sort of out of integrity, I think, at the end of the day, right? I mean, that's certainly. People are asking for you to go into a little more detail about number seven. Understand. Um, yep, okay. So number seven. So one of, the, one of the things that I hear from my students is, you know, if we do this, what's going to happen? You know, are we going to suffer? You know, first of all, I would say, the first thing I would say in response to that is that, you know, I think... Uh, you know, getting out of your own way, um, breaking the rules, uh, acting and speaking with power, building a powerful brand, networking, etc. And none of this really I would consider to be unethical. I don't think it's unethical uh, to build uh, strategic relationships. I don't think it's unethical to learn how to speak in a more forceful fashion. I don't think mm -hmm. it's unethical to break the rules, particularly if the rules disadvantage you. I will point out that... Um, you know, Nelson Mandela became the father of South Africa while he was in jail. Um, so not only did he apparently break the rules, but I guess he was breaking the law, which is why he was sentenced to, to prison. Um, you know, so I you know, so I don't think any of this is, is particularly unethical. But um, what, the, what the rule seven says is that, and you can see a billion examples of this, um, is that once you have power, um, that what you did to get it will be mostly forgotten, forgiven, are excused. Um, you know, Martha Stewart served time in jail. Her brand has never been more valuable. Michael Milken served time in jail. Not that I'm suggesting that you go to jail, but <laughs> you, know, you, got, you got the point. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, prior to his committing suicide and serving time in jail, um, uh, after he was convicted as a sex offender, was a, um, a, you know, continued to associate with some of the most powerful people in the world, including apparently members of the royal family. And again, I'm not advocating that you be a sex offender or that you do any of these horrible things, but I'm just pointing out that we tend to, because of a variety of psychological dynamics that I explore in that chapter, we tend to, we tend to reconstruct people in ways that justify uh, their deservingness of what they've achieved. Uh, you know, I mean, it has been documented several different times and in several different places that Bill Gates stole the code on which Microsoft is built. People forget that. People have forgiven that, et cetera. Mm. Again, that doesn't say you ought to go steal the code, but it does say that what you do, um, that your first responsibility, and Machiavelli really talked about this a, a zillion years ago, 
uh, the first responsibility of a leader is to keep his or her position. You know, Stanford's business school's motto, which I love, change lives, change organizations, change the world. In order to do that, you have to be in a position of leverage. You're not gonna change lives, change organizations, or change the world unless you have some power and influence. And so your first responsibility is to get that power and influence. And what you've done, and once you've done that, people will, people want to associate with success, people want to associate with winning. Uh, and so um, that will. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that uh, the other thing that you described beautifully in the book is about uh, rule number five, um, networking relentlessly. I think that there's always been a lot of talk about the importance of networking. And I think everybody knows that as almost a cliche these days. And I know as coaches where I know I am in a position where I'm often having discussions with my clients about what they should be doing to build their brand, be networking, building relationships. And I thought you did a really masterful job of breaking down networking in terms of focus, time, effort, all of those kinds of key elements. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I think people, you know, I mean, the evidence suggests that people don't spend enough time on, the, on building relationships. They spend more time on uh, the technical, if you will, aspects of their job than they do on building relationships, which is, you know, not a, a good thing to do. And, and, and then I think, you know, I think people spend um, too much time with the people that they know well, um, right. with their strong ties and insufficient time with the weak ties, um, which are oftentimes much more helpful because they bring you non-redundant information and contacts. Uh, the strong ties tend to be people who travel in the same circles and know the same things that you do, and you need to learn from different people. We talk about learning from diversity, but oftentimes our networks are insufficiently diverse. And I'm not talk talking about race and gender, though that's, of course, one aspect, but I'm also talking about diversity in terms of experience, background, industry, etc. So absolutely. And then the other thing I think people can do as they network is they can connect people. You know, you, yeah. can bridge, you can bridge people who would profitably interact with each other. And if you connect them to each other, you've actually performed an amazing service. Right. Yeah, I thought that you sort of took apart this theme of networking beautifully with uh, key elements that can help anyone be more focused and actually sort of stretch themselves without feeling overwhelmed because yeah. so so much of the time clients will say to me i just don't have time to network but of course their definition of networking there is just going around glad handing or you know going to parties or whatever and you're much more focused on that strategically yeah. and also i think you know one of the things one of the suggestions that um keith ferrazzi uh, who wrote the famous book never eat alone recommends and we recommended when he came to my class and I now have my students do an exercise on this, which is, you know, write out 10 people, uh, list out 10 people or 15 or 20, however many you want, that if you had a connection with them, they could be helpful to you. Either they could teach you stuff or they could provide you social support or uh, they could help you in, in, in terms of linking up with other people who could advance your career and then figure out how you're going to meet them. And, you know, I have a friend uh, who, you know, I'm starting a podcast series next week. It's going to launch called Pfeffer on Power. It will be available on all the uh, things, uh, on all the normal platforms, Spotify and Apple, etc. And one of the people I interviewed for that podcast is a guy named Benjamin Fernandez, um, who was... Um, a student at Stanford, uh, one of the youngest students in the MBA program, he uh, started a payments company in Tanzania because his family is from Tanzania. Um, I hope one day that he will become the president of Tanzania. He may, who knows? And he talked about how he reached out to people, including you know people from some of the largest uh, digital banks in the UK uh, to, get, to get advice to help him build this digital payments system. And the reason why he's building a digital payment system in Africa is Africa has two qualities. It is a relatively poor continent and the transfer of money into Africa has some of the highest fees in the world. So mm. it's, it is inconsistent to be a relatively economically poor continent and have to pay the highest fees to transfer money. And so that's right. why he started this payment company. 
which is a great example of the kind of impact that a powerful leader can have, right? In terms yeah. of, and, as you described. And he, did, and he did, I mean, he did just a wonderful story. Uh, so when, um, when guests would come uh, to the class, uh, not to my class, but to any class he was in, he would always wear a very colorful African, you know, uh, themed uh, African print shirt. He would go up to them after class. He would connect with them on something they had written on LinkedIn or some other medium on their posts. And he would say, can I take a picture with you? And after a while, of course, he had built his brand. He went from about three or 4,000 um, people uh, to over 100,000 connections by the time he graduated, everybody wow. associated him with power. This, of course, permitted him uh, to be relatively more successful in raising money to start this payments company, which is called Nala, N-A-L-A, and Nala.com in Africa. Great story in terms of what's possible, right? When you do these kinds of use, as you would say, the use of power. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting a lot. Go ahead. Go on. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, we're just starting to get a lot of really good questions. And uh, so I kind of want to turn um, to the audience and remind you all out there that we will try to get to as many of your questions as we can. But I'm going to start right away um, with the question I asked you when we chatted before. So I'm not surprised. Uh, Michael Mata is asking, why is rule number seven not unethical? Um, rule number seven, I, so I really have, I, so I was, so first of all, I'm not a moral philosopher. I'm trained as a social scientist. So I always try to stay in my lane, so to speak, with respect to uh, what I can explain. And I think rule number seven, I, I, people need to understand why the world is the way it is. Because if you're going to change lives, change organizations, change the world, you have to begin with an understanding of how the world works and why it works the way it does. People were surprised that Donald Trump not only was elected, but you know, unless he's in jail, he, he has a reasonable chance of being elected to a second term. And they say, this man lies. Well, you know, you need to understand the social science research on lying. Um, this man has apparently broken laws. Some people believe he's committed treason. Well, you know, that's interesting. It may be true. You need to understand why people are willing to forgive him for that. You need to understand why the never Trumpers became pro Trumpers. Uh, and by the way, what is true for Donald Trump is true for CEOs as well. You see examples of this really all the time. Uh, there is, as I pointed out to you when we had our conversation the other day, almost no overlap between the most admired CEOs or for that matter, the most admired companies and the companies that are on the best places to work list. Isn't that interesting? So instead of having some kind of emotional, moral reaction, you know, um, I would quote um, well, the American poet Walt Whitman, be curious, not judgmental. Um, I would quote Mother Teresa, if you judge people, you don't have time to love them. I would, you know, um, I would quote Matthew 7, judge not that ye be not judged. I would quote the Quran that says only Allah can judge people. I think we are filled with moral judgments, uh, which oftentimes, you know, it's fine to have a moral judgment, but before you have the moral judgment, you need to understand and, and be a very good and, and shrewd observer of the world and a very good and, and understand how that world works and why it works that way. If I'm going to drive from San Francisco, where my house in Hillsborough to San Francisco, I not only need to know, you know, what the root route is, I need to understand what the barriers and obstacles are going to be. One of the reasons why I wrote apparently your favorite book, Leadership BS, is that 50, <laughs> years, of, is that 50 years of leadership training has accomplished almost nothing. Uh, you know, companies will tell you, I mean, the survey evidence, companies will tell you they have a shortage of leaders. Leaders are losing their jobs. You know, leaders are getting fired. People are suffering. The euphemism is called career derailments. And I believe it is the responsibility of coaches to help people not have career derailments, to help people be in position so they can change lives, change organizations, and change the world. And that's, that's our first responsibility. So before I say to you, Jeffrey, I think you ought to think this way or that way, my first responsibility is to take you from wherever you are and to make you the most effective version of Jeffrey Hull I can. Yeah, and when you talked with me the other day and I pressed you on this about the moral component of leadership and people are commenting 
that, you know, we, to a certain extent, we can't completely sidestep the moral side of things. But I think what you're also trying to do is get us to take off our blinders to the way the world really works, right? And um, you describe sort of the stages that people go through when they hear these rules. And it reminded me of the stages of death and dying in uh, Elizabeth Moss Cantor. That's exactly right. So I tell my students on the first day of the class uh, that they will go through, you know, first denial. This doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply in my culture. It doesn't apply here. It doesn't apply in today's world, etc. That's the f- denial. Then they will go through anger, often directed at me, which is fine. Uh, then they will go through sadness. You know, isn't it terrible that the world works the way it is? Isn't it terrible that the democracy is demonstrably on re- in, in retreat all over the world? That strong leaders, often strong men, frankly, uh, you know, have, uh, you know have, have, have taken over. Isn't it terrible that the Philippines have elected Ferdinand Marcos Jr.? I mean, his father, you know, and by the way, I recommend to people watching The Kingmaker, this amazing documentary on Imelda Marcos, who at the age of 90 made her son president again, by the way, in an election, which he won by an overwhelming majority. So, Yes, uh, people get sad. And finally, if we are successful, and that's one of the reasons why I use coaches to help people make this kind of, you know, get comfortable with all this material. If they are, if we are successful, by the end of the class, eight weeks for online, 10 weeks for on campus, people come to a stage of, of acceptance that this is that I do understand the, the way the world works. I understand the social science verities, which by the way have not changed. And I'm going to use this knowledge as I would use a tool. Power is in fact a tool to accomplish amazing things, to you know, start up you know, a money payments uh, organization in Africa or to start up you know, whatever kind of startup they are starting up. And Stanford, of course, is a, a hotbed of entrepreneurship. And I'm going, to, I'm going to use these rules to be more successful in my fundraising, in my recruiting, in my managing of my uh, VC relationships, uh, in my managing of my relationships with my suppliers and customers, et cetera. So the questions that we're getting related to this, I'm just, I, I think you've kind of touched on it, but I just want to honor the question. Tandi uh, Zimande is asking, is having a strong value system incongruent with becoming powerful? Uh, no, I, but, I, but I, think, I think one thing is inconsistent with becoming powerful. I, the powerful people that I have seen are extraordinarily pragmatic. That doesn't mm. mean you don't have values, but it does mean you understand you know, how to navigate through uh, through the world and not uh, you know I would say you, you need you, you obviously need a compass and you need a gyroscope uh, but you right. also need to you also need to meet people where they are you need you 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 cannot you know so my friend Gary Loveman who for many years was a professor at Harvard and then he went on uh, to become CEO of Caesars Harris. Um, Harris first, and then it became known as Caesars, and then he became a senior executive at Aetna, the health insurance company, and now he's got a startup called Well. And he pointed out that critical relationships have to work, that if, you, that if you are on my critical path in order to get things done, and I decide I don't like you, I don't respect you, I think you're unethical, I think you're all kinds of things, all this judgment stuff that gets in people's way, is not going to be helpful. And, you know, unless I can somehow get rid of you or get convince the organization to get rid of you, if you're on my critical path to get things done, that relationship has to work. And it is my responsibility to make that relationship work. And let me suggest that unless people are a hell of a lot better actors than most of them are, (laughs) if I lead with this idea that I think, you know, I, I have contempt for you, that relationship is probably not going to be very effective. And so I have to say, you know, you're you're here. I have to figure out how to deal with you, and I have to um, I have to figure out a, a way to make critical relationships work. No, it makes perfect sense. It's not always easy to stomach, but it makes perfect sense. Um, Joe Gregory has a great question, which is that you've said, you know, at the outset and in your book that the research really hasn't changed, but has anything really changed in the forty years that you've been working on this subject of leadership? 
Um, well, my understanding of it is, is, is expanded, and the research base has certainly expanded. But the fundamental, you know, I think, you know, many of the principles of commitment and um, the principles that Robert Cialdini, who, by the way, is an endorser of this book, as is the famous coach, Marshall Goldsmith, endorsed this book as well. Um, I, I think, you know, I think many of the principles of influence are fundamentally um, the same. And I right. think the reason why they are the same is because the fundamental things that drive people. Uh, you know, I'm not a huge believer in evolutionary psychology, but I think what people have learned to do intuitively over the years is fundamentally the, you know, in order to survive, you have to be able to distinguish friend from foe. You have to be able to distinguish who's going to win and you have to be able to align with your friends and with people who are going to be successful. So yes, Bob Cialdini wrote Basking in Reflected Glory in 1976. And it is still true that we love to be associated with success. I think he wrote a book on influence too, right? Persuasion. Yeah, well, yes, yeah. Well, the, the study of Basking in Reflected Glory from 1976. No, he's written a zillion versions of influence. And by the way, I think his book, Persuasion, is at least as good as his book on influence, which talks about um, uh, how to become more persuasive. It's a fabulous book. Yeah, no, I would agree. I worked with him in my uh, teaching at NYU. So I'm getting prompted to ask a question from Deborah, and Deborah's question is floating by quickly. So let me grab it. Hold on, Deborah, don't, don't chat for a second, guys. Okay, so there are many professionals who assert that Donald Trump has mental health issues, could be a psychopath, a narcissist, et cetera. Where does mental health Fit, I'm going to skip this, but fit into your worldview with regard to leadership. A great question, Deb. It is a great question. So there is, of course, an enormous social science literature on the effects of narcissism on getting hired, getting promoted, becoming successful. And of course, narcissism positively affects almost every uh, positive career outcome. And by the way, some of the studies have been done actually in the military as well. Um, there have been studies that look at, you know, psychopathy. psychopathy. Uh, I just wrote an article uh, for some obscure journal, but you can find it. It's called The Dark Triad is Not So Dark. You know, I mean, basically, basically, again, I, this drives me nuts. I mean, we have this idea where we've classified people as mentally ill or mentally this or mentally that. And, you know, and, and we use all these value laden terms as opposed to being willing to say, OK, you know, is, is you know, it's not just Donald Trump, uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs. I mean, you know, many of these people did not exhibit leadership behaviors that we advocate. And right. we need to ask, you know, why were they successful? What is there? You know, why do people follow them? Why do why do people follow them? My friend Gene Lippmann Blumen. Um, you know, wrote a book about the allure of a, the, the title of the book was the allure of toxic leaders. And, you know, if, if we're, if we're going to change any of this, we need to begin with an understanding of the, of the social dynamics. Right. No, I agree with you on that. It's sometimes shocking to the system to have to look right at the truth, but well, yeah. Don is asking I, a question. I, so I would just, I would just point out that, you know, that if, that if I, you know, I've, I'm surrounded by, and I now actually am doing research on health because I think many workplaces are in fact toxic and really are killing people. But, you know, to the extent that I now have a lot of association with people in the medical profession, uh, the difference between medicine and management is clear. I mean, you know, if I want to study pancreatic cancer, that doesn't mean I approve of pancreatic cancer. But by <laughs> God, if I'm going to figure out how to have more, more effective treatments for any form of cancer, I can't say, oh, cancer is bad. I'm not going to look at it. I need to understand the mechanisms that permit cancer right. to grow, right. to thrive, how cancer cells become literally immortal. I need to understand how they uh, bring blood supply to them. In other words, the treatments require us to understand the mechanisms. And I would argue that that's why medicine has made, made a hell of a lot more progress than management. No, that's, that's, that's interesting. And then, you know, people are in the, in the chat section, I noticed a few people are concerned about using, you know, Bezos and other, Musk and others as in terms of defining them as successful. And I, you and I talked about this the other day that, um, you know, it's not always easy for us to look at what is success. This is certainly those kinds of, those folks have thousands of employees and are having an impact all over the world. 
So yeah, the question and, and becomes- And by the way, are enormously rich. And, and by the way, have people who are willing to work for them, notwithstanding that when you go to work for Amazon, there's Jody Canner and David Streetfield's article about how toxic not only the warehouses are, but the white collar workforce. And, and, and I've, you know, uh, they are still able, uh, and, and people understand, you know, what, what Elon Musk is, and they're still willing to go to work for them. And you need to understand those social dynamics. Right, right. It's crucial to being a good coach. And I'd like to do segue a little bit to our last few minutes, because I think you'd have some great insights to offer coaches. And, um, Amy Kimball has a great question here, which is, what are some of the interventions you believe can help that coaches can use to prevent their clients from career derailments? And I would add, to help them be more successful in gaining and utilizing power effectively. So what my coaches mostly do is, first of all, help to give the students feedback on the exercises I use in the class and my course outline is available on my website, jeffreypfeffer.com. And if you send me an email, which don't send to Pfeffer because Suzanne Pfeffer, who is no related to me, not related to me, is a very famous biochemist and she's Pfeffer at stanford.edu. I'm Pfeff at stanford.edu, but she will forward your email to me. She, she said, she and I said, well, someday should actually meet in person. Um, you know, because she gets, she gets more emails. To me I mean, you're I probably right across campus from each other, right? Well, yeah, but it's a large campus. Anyway, um, um, so I'm happy to send you the course outline. And I have a series of exercises. And I think one thing that the coaches do is they provide feedback on those exercises, such as brand building. You know, I have an exercise on brand building. I have an exercise on networking. I have an exercise on, you know, acting and speaking with power how to show up in a more powerful way. So I think one intervention or one set of interventions is around helping people master the knowledge and master those skills. You know, how do you, you know, um, how do you um, get out of your own way? What are, what are the things that you're doing? You know, are you saying, which I see people do, you know, pardon me for interrupting. I'm going to make this comment. I'm not sure the comment's valuable. That I don't think is a good way uh, to begin this thing. You know, pardon me for, um, you know, uh, the self-deprecating comments. Uh, Golda Meir, according to Bob Cialdini, and then I found the quote, uh, Golda Meir once said to somebody, she's the, of course, now deceased prime minister of Israel, don't be so modest, you're not that good, um, which is, I think, a very, a very profound statement. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, what are you doing to get in your own way? What are you doing? Um, how are you inhibiting yourself? by saying, you know, there are people in my workplace that I don't like, they're important, they're critical to my success, uh, but I don't like them, so I avoid them. Is that really the best response that you right. want to make? You know, are, are there ways in which you can find something, a, a way of relating to them in a way that doesn't, you know, compromise you too much, but still build a positive relationship with people who are important to your career? So I think there are a variety of things that coaches can do to help people get out of their own way and to, and to help them think about who do I need to build relationships with? How am I going to do it? How am I going to show up in a more powerful fashion? What is my brand? You know, what, what, what are the three or four sentences that describe who I am and why I'm uniquely qualified um, for the job that I'm doing or for the job to which I aspire? And I can give you again a, a zillion examples of that. You know, what are the rules that I am taking too seriously? You know, many people, you know, my colleague Frank Flynn and Vanessa Lake wrote this um, research study. It's entitled, If You Need Help, Just Ask. I think people don't ask for enough. People don't mm. ask for help enough. It's often flattering to say, you know, Jeff, you're an expert, you're a genius person. Tell me, uh, you tell, give me some advice. I want to follow in your footsteps. I would like to be as successful as you. Can you help me do that? Uh, you know, most people I think are horrible mind readers. You know, I had a woman who was sent by Nike and I said to her, what are you gonna do when you go back to Nike? And she said, well, whatever HR assigns me. And of course I rolled my eyes and I said, <laughs> you know, I said, if you want a specific position, when you go back to Nike, maybe you should let them know, 
you know, they, they've invested a quarter of a million dollars in your education. Maybe you should let them know what you feel qualified to right. do and what your aspirations are as, assume, as opposed to assuming that somehow they're going to figure this out by God knows what process. And so she actually um, told them the job that she wanted and why she wanted that and how she thought her prior experience and her year at Stanford had helped her get ready for that job. And they said, thank you for telling us, you know, because we've great. invested in you. The last thing we want to do is put you in a job that doesn't play to your strengths, to use the Gallup book title, exactly. you know, and, and so how can we, the, the best way to do that is to have conversations with people. So yes, there are a variety. No, I, yeah, there's a wonderful quote that uh, I think uh, Patricia just put in the chat from um, gold in my ear. Don't be so modest. You're not that good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. I think that's really excellent. So folks are dying to hear you speak a little bit about diversity, diverse styles, whether or not this applies in every country. Um, and I know you and I talked about that. And a number of your case studies in the book are with women, people of color, people from different parts of the world. So can you address this idea of whether or not power is um, different in different parts of different cultures and different parts of the world and different genders? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, so I, you know, I wrote an article entitled You're Still the Same um, based on the Bob Seger song, um, which basically makes the argument as to why power is both the relatively unchanged across cultures and across contexts. Now, obviously, you're going to show up differently. I mean, you know, you're not going to dress the same. Uh, people are going to speak in different languages. Uh, there are different customs. Uh, there are different foods. There are different all kinds of things. So if I were going to do an event in the United States and I was going to do an event in, you know, Tanzania, I would probably, you know, dress differently. I would have different food. I would, you know, make the invitations different. But the fundamental underlying social science verities are the same. Um, Susan Fisk has done a study of interpersonal perception. She's found two dimensions which uh, occur across countries, warmth and competence. She has found, by the way, which many people don't like, but it's true that warmth and competence are often perceived as being negatively correlated, even though, of course, they are obviously independent dimensions. You can be incompetent and cold and warm and competent and all other combinations, uh, but people tend to perceive warmth and competence as negatively related. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, to the, you know, I, I, so the manifestations and the playing it out is going to be different, but the fundamental principles I think are the same. What about cultures? Um, I'm not clear. I, I didn't get the person's name, but they were asking that there are some cultures who value humility especially Asian cultures, um, indigenous you know, cultures. So I, so, the, so, you know, so years ago when I used to do group projects, now I have everybody do an individual project. Some group said to me, basically, um, Asian cultures value humility. And I said, do a group project, you know, go look at some Asian leaders and come back. And they said, well, of course, at the end, you were right. If you think about this, um, you know, oftentimes, how do I say this? So oftentimes we are told things. Um, you know, so I have colleagues at Stanford Business School who tell me, who give talks to students, who teach classes on modesty, authenticity, <laughs> etc. And I say to, my, to the students, I say, you know, people are going to say all kinds of things. Go look. You know, go talk to people who work with them. Go look at how many times they've been sued by their partners, you know, because suits are a matter of public record. Go, you know, I mean, so yes, you know, people are going to tell you all kinds of things. The question I would ask is when you go into an organization or a setting, look who actually gets ahead. So I, I'll give you a couple of examples off the top of my head. So in Australia, they have what's called a tall poppy syndrome. The tall poppy gets cut down. Okay, look at Carrie Packer. Look at the Carrie Packer's son, since Carrie Packer's dead. Look at Rupert Murdoch. Look at, you know, people who have succeeded in the Australian context. Go to, go to Japan. Look at Morita, the founder of Sony. 
you know, uh, who wrote, I think, a book called the, J J J J the Japan That Doesn't Say No or the, the Japan That Shouldn't Say No or something to that effect. So there are all kinds of uh, what I would call conventional wisdom, but before people buy into the conventional wisdom, you need to be a good observer of the world around you. I can right. tell you from my experience, my books have sold better in these countries that supposedly don't follow these principles than they have in America, uh, which includes both Japan and China. So I, you know. Yeah, there's a cynical side of me that says that might be because there's an Americanization of the world that's happening that may or may not be a good thing. <laughs> may or may not be, but whatever. But no, I, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you, you look at, Look at China, look at, look at the ruler of China, who's apparently now going to be ruler for life, you know. Yeah, nope, there's he's, certainly he's, power. He's the king of seven rules. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place for us to stop. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, this is, this is challenging and provocative. And what I really appreciate about your work, Jeff, is that you, you know, you, you put it out there, you have a strong stance, but you also back it up with solid social science research. So I encourage you, all of you, I can see in the comments, some people are finding this challenging. We're not surprised, but we as coaches, we really need to know the research. We need to be looking not through rose-colored glasses around how power is acquired, how it's used. So that I think you're right, so that we can help our clients acquire it and use it for good at the end of the day and hopefully to change the world. So, And I would end with one other thought. I, I really think the job of an educator is not to tell people what they already know. Well said. You know, I, you know, I mean, I, my job is not to, you know, play into, you know, okay, first of all, it's all, as you pointed out, science and evidence-based, which it is, but set, and it has lots of examples, which, which, which I do in, 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 in Seven Rules of Power. But also, you know, if I tell you stuff that you already know, my value add is zero. Well, and what you're saying is so true for coaching, right? If a coach is not being provocative and not being unsettling and not making his or her client somewhat uncomfortable, then I don't think they're doing their job. So... You know, I think that what goes for leadership goes for coaching in this in this domain. And uh, with that, we've hit the hour. And I just want to say I really, really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. This is our kickoff for the fall. And I think your book is, like I said, provocative but important. And I would encourage all of us to get out and get a copy, send nasty letters to Jeff if we have to, but I'm sure he's used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, thank you again, Jeff, for taking the time to be with the Institute of Coaching. It's been a privilege. My pleasure. And thank you for being such a great conversation partner. Oh, well, I appreciate the work. So I'm glad I was able to do it. It's an honor. And thank you all. And we will see you in a couple of weeks. Um, I think we're having a webinar on interculturalism. So taking us in a completely different direction. So that's great for our continuation of fall education at the Institute of Coaching. And we will look forward to seeing you then. Take care, everyone. Bye.